Grade 12 learners of South Africa, welcome to Mindset and the two of us or we, the rest of us, all of us together are going to spend the next hour and 15 minutes on diversity and finishing off evolution. Now this section of work, we, we, the last one, we did diversity and the changes that have occurred in plants and animal species and speciation. Now we're going to look at the changes that have occurred to allow for human evolution. Again, I take you back to when I said, don't think in religious terms. We're going on scientific terms, okay, and scientific theories and hypotheses. We, nobody lived 500 million years ago. Nobody was there writing, taking records and typing up um, information in history and data. So we have to rely on theories, and that's all they are. They are theories and hypotheses because there is not absolute evidence of evolution. Learn your theories, all right? This section of work can give you very easy marks in an exam. Here we go. Diversity, which means the differences that we have, and with that diversity, we are going to have human evolution theories. People, they are theories. They are not written in stone. Okay, evidence of evolution. Now we have support resources, those kind of things we're going to look at. We'll look at geology, there's anatomy, there's embryology, genetics, physiology. These are all different processes that support the fact that we all originated from specific ancestors. All right, you just need to know geological evidence and what fossils are. So if we look at the geological evidence, the earth now, people, you must know this. The Earth is regarded as about 5,000 million years old. Okay, that's very old. 5,000 million years old. That's, five, that's more than 5 billion years. Okay, the first rec record of living material was preserved as a fossil, and that is from what we call the Paleozoic Era, which is approximately 540 million years ago. Of the 5,000 million years, you're looking at 540 million years ago. So it's a long time. Fossils provide evidence of life forms that existed. Um, they also show the intermediate forms of organisms that have been discovered that illustrate changing forms of plants and animals. So we look to fossils, people dig up fossils, um, and you look at the fossil and, well, there's something that looks like an organism that is between um, a fish and a mammal, um, well, maybe that is a bird, maybe it is an amphibian, um, or look, here's an animal that has no vertebrae, and that's what they do. They look at the different plants and animal forms that they can dig up in fossils, and they try to fit them into groups. You know, us human beings always have to put everything into little squares. Okay, some terms to know. Now, these terms I've given you, they are in your X sheets, people. You have to look at your X sheets, learn those definitions. If you learn what I've put on those X sheets, I promise you now you'll get 100% for evolution or, or the section on diversity. So, first of all, anthropology. What is anthropology? It's the study of the human race, okay, including the different belief systems, the customs and the social behaviors. In other words, everything about us that makes us human beings and all our different little things that we like and that we do. All right, so it's our different belief systems, customs, social habits, etc. Then paleontology, that is the study of the earliest known periods of human existence. And here you'll go through all the different ages. So for example, the Stone Age and the implements people used, etc., etc. So paleontology is slightly different from anthropology. Then we get archaeology. 
Now, archaeologists dig up sites. They go back to ancient times and they dig up things that were buried in ancient times and they look at the buildings and the tools and the animals and the plant fossils and the remains that are found within the rock strata. Those are archaeologists. All right. And then here, um, it's archaeology, your archaeologist. This is a specific scientist that is going to study fossils and whatever is in those, the rock strata, the rock strata is the layers of rock. So remember, the deeper down you're going, the older those strata are. They were formed long time before the top layer was, and that's how it happens. Okay, we've got archaeologists use carbon dating, okay, to determine when the animals and the plants lived to establish a progression of forms. Now, people, logic will tell you, your progression of forms would be if, um, if I look at a, a layer of rock that is 50 meet or 100 meters into the ground and the plant and animal life that's been compressed there and I look at 50 meters and then I look at 20 meters and then at 10 meters um, and we look at the bones and the plant forms that are preserved in those layers of rock, it's going to show a progression of forms. So it progresses from 100 meters and as we go up so those forms are going to be different and that would be the different species. Okay, so it shows a progression of forms. A paleontologist and anthropologists use this information that the archaeologist gives them, okay, and then they determine what led to extinction or what evolutionary changes took place. So your paleontologists and your anthropologists take what the archaeologists find and they say, okay, based on these findings, this is how we have progressed. So our progression of forms. Fossils. Now the word fossils from Latin and it means to imprint. Um, traces or preserved remains. But all of those are basically uh, um, what you can uh, translate as the word fossil. All right, now fossilization is clearly the process that took place to produce a fossil. So you want a fossil, we have to have fossilization. And what do you need for fossilization to occur? I mean, lots of things don't get fossilized. Some things do. Why did that specific structure get fossilized, but it, another structure did not? Okay, first of all, you must have the correct climatic conditions. Secondly, the body part must be covered with dust or silt first. And the dust and the silt preserve it. All right, the process occurs over millions of years. And we have fossils are the remains of organisms like shells, skeletal bones, teeth, imprints of leaves, etc. Remember, the organic part is going to rot away. Um, and you left with only the, the basic structure. So in leaves, you would have the basic structure of the xylem vessels, the veins, in other words. The rest will rot away. Um, with us as, as animals, plants, you are, I mean with animals, you're going to have the bones staying behind. And all the soft tissue will rot away. But where the bones are and the way they structured, etc., it gives a lot of, it gives your, your anthropologists a big, an amazing idea of what was around those bones, okay? So, the age of fossils. Now we have different types of, of dating of fossils. First, you have relative age. Now, relative age means if you have five brothers and sisters, okay, so you're the sixth or, or you are one of six children, the relative age will put you guys in a chronological order. So, you'll have Brother one would be two years old. Brother three, uh, brother two would be four years old. Sister would be six years old. And you are then in a chronological age. So your age relative to each other would make you older or younger. So when we look at relative age, we're looking at the layers of the rock. And we know that this bottom layer here, that would be the top layer. This would be a low down layer. So that would be low down through the rock. This layer here would be older than this layer, and that would be older than that layer, and that would be older than this layer, and so your youngest layer would be on top. And your older layer would be lower down. 
So that is relative age. So we look at the sedimentary rocks that are formed over a long period of time. Each layer contains organisms that lived in that period. So each of these layers would have a period um, or, or represent a period. Now, the layers are covered over with a new layer of sedimentary rock and soil. And the fossils found in the upper layers will be newer people than those found lower down. Clearly, they are going to be older. So we look then at the relative age. If it's found here versus there, then we know, well, this lot here were in date back 50,000 years, and these date back about 10,000 years, and those date back about 1,000 years, and this is now. You follow? So it's the relative age. Absolute age, okay, this is very accurate. It can be, it, it is really very, very, very accurate and it's measured in years. Now there are two techniques that archaeologists are going to use for this absolute age. Because relative age is well where it lies, but, but your, your, um, if we look at absolute age, we are, they are actually very, very accurate. So we have two types of dating. We have radioactive dating. And the way they do this is they say that radioactive elements like uranium is found in rocks. Okay, and as the rocks get old, so the uranium changes to lead. Okay, so if something is not very old, it's going to have lots of uranium. If it is, and I'm going to put in inverted commas, young. Okay, and if it is old, sorry, if it is old, it's going to have less uranium, but it's also going to have more lead. Why? Because the lead, the uranium converts into lead. So what they do is they look at the uranium and the lead levels, okay, of a fossil as it's stuck in this rock. And this method is used for fossils that are older than 100 million years. Okay, so why? Because for the uranium to convert to lead takes a lot of years. And all they're doing is they're checking the amount of lead versus the amount of uranium in that rock that's around the fossil. All right, and when they've established that, then they know if it's 50-50, then they know this, this structure is about 150 million years old. But it's for anything that's over 100 million years, because otherwise there'll just be lots of uranium and no lead. Carbon dating is the second type of, of uh, relative or of aging process that we look at for fossils and um, for absolute age. With carbon dating, we look at things that are living. So in other words, all organic. Or another word for organic is biotic organisms and they all contain an atom called a carbon-14 okay and it's radioactive which is important now when the organism dies the carbon-14 atom is converted into nitrogen so we start off with C14 atom and that C14 atom is now converted to nitrogen so again the more nitrogen we have so if you have more nitrogen, it's going to be older. If you have less nitrogen, it's going to be younger. Okay. So we look at the carbon-14 atom and the way it's converted into nitrogen over time. Lots of nitrogen, it's going to be old. Less nitrogen from carbon-14, so you're going to have lots of carbon-14, less nitrogen, it's going to be younger. So, they know the rate of conversion, and once the carbon-14 level is determined, they can say how old the fossil is. And this is normally used for any th a fossil that's believed to be less than 50,000 years old. So, if it's more than 50,000 years, then they're going to start looking at the uranium levels, okay, and if it is less than 50,000, they're going to look at the carbon-14. People, you must know this. So make sure that you understand if it's less than 50,000, it's carbon-14. And if it's more than 50,000 years to 100 and more, they're going to now start looking at um, 
the uranium lead conversion. But the uranium lead conversion will start probably, you probably start picking it up from about 90,000 years old. So from 90,000 onwards, so you're looking at your carbon-14, and then from there you start looking at your uranium lead conversion. Okay, here's an ammonite fossil. That's what it looked like. This is clearly the shell. And this here is the fossil of Archeo Archaeopteryx, um, which is from the Jurassic Age. This is a bird-like structure that had wings. Um, now we look at comparative anatomy, and this gives you anatomical evidence. So with the anatomical evidence, we're going to be looking at the structures of the body and how they form the different phylums. Now remember, we belong to vertebrata. Why? Because we have a spinal cord and, a ver and vertebra around the spinal cord. That is divided into five or, or five sub-phylums, and that would be your um, uh, fish and amphibians and birds and reptiles and mammals. Why? We all have a vertebral column. So we look at all the different structures in the systems, and that's what puts us into a phylum. Now, if we look at homologous organs, remember homo always means the same. There's a similarity in the formation of the body parts of the organ due to a common evolutionary origin. So in other words, the structure of the pedantical limbs in seals, bats, and humans, it's our arms. Okay, so if we look at the arm structure, you're going to find them in bats, and bats fly. You're going to find them in humans. Well, we use our arms for a whole bunch of things. Certainly not walking, though. Um, seals have little flippers that they use. All right, so they're going to use these pedantical limbs to move, to swim. We use them for all the things that we do, and a bat will use it to fly. So they are homologous structures. Why? They have the same common evolutionary origin. All right? So the bones, the muscles, the nerves are arranged in a similar manner, and we end up with structures that are very similar but are used for different things. So similar structures, same origin, different things. That's homologous. If we look at analogous organs, Okay, these are different structures of body parts or organs with a similar functions. So they have a different, they, they've originated and evolved from a different process, but they have the same or similar function. And here we'd look at the lungs in mammals, we'd look at the trachea in insects, and we'd look at the gills in fish. So they have a similar function, Okay, but a different origin. If it is homologous, it has a similar origin, but a different function. And that's how you need to remember them. Homologous, they, they have a similar origin, but they end up with a different function. For analogous, they have a, a, um, a, similar, a, a different origin, but they end up being a similar function to take in oxygen. Okay. Differences in appearance of, of organisms within a species. Now, this is something called variation, which we've gone through in the previous session. So how do we get the variation? Why is there variation? Well, we know that in meiosis, we have the crossing over phase, where you've got your chromosomes crossing over. Okay? And your chromosomes crossing over, you're going to have a piece of the chromosome from your father and a piece of the chromosome from the mother and that is going to result in a chromosome that looks like this. You're going to have our shaded chromosome with a piece from the white one and you're going to have this piece here which is now on the white chromosome. That's the crossing over during prophase one Okay, and the random assortment or arrangement of the chromosomes during metaphase of meiosis. Now, mutations, if they are fixed, remember, a mutation that's fixed becomes fixed in that body. So it will then result in a characteristic, okay? If it is neutral, it is there, 
but when conditions change, it will either become a fixed mutation or a lethal mutation and kill the organism. Okay, and that fixed and neutral mutations are because of point and shift mutations on the DNA. And then you have random mating, all right, it's very important. So if there's random mating, the mates are selected and that is the mate that, that, that will fertilize the egg cells. And we have random fertilization. Now all of these processes are going to lead to variations within one species, okay? within one species. The random mating and the random fertilization is important. All right, now, if we look at this question, okay, in an investigation, a biotechnologist injected chimpanzee blood into a rabbit. Okay, the immune system of the rabbit recognizes the chimpanzee blood protein as, a, as foreign. It's like putting a splinter in your finger. It's foreign. It doesn't belong there. And produces antibodies. Okay? The rabbit's antibodies were then extracted and they were used to develop a serum. Right. Now I know that nowhere do you learn about this. It's a question to test your theories and whether you understand your work so you can apply it. Okay, people, now if we look at this table, always write your information on here so that you can see it when you're going to your question. So we know that we're now comparing the chimp or chimpanzees, all right, and how closely related they are. Now, if there is a lot of precipitate, so just write here um, lots of precipitate, it means that it is close. A close relationship and if there is less precipitate okay then it's going to be further away in other words it's not going to be closely related all right now if we look at these it tells you the animal species and the percentage of precipitate that's been formed so with a gorilla it's very high there's lots and lots and lots of precipitate that's formed which means it is very close it's a very close relationship between the chimp and the gorilla. With a baboon, it is high, so it is close. With a monkey, it's moderate, so it's not very close. Okay, and the pig is very low. So with the pig, it means that they are not very related at all. So it's very low, there's less precipitate, so it's further away, so not close at all, quite far away. Let's look at our questions. What is the composition of the serum? Now the question told you what the composition of the serum was, okay? And the, all you have to do is look here. It says, when the serum, okay, blah, 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 blah. Here, um, the rabbit's antibodies were then extracted and developed as a serum. So the serum contains antibodies that are against because it recognizes the chimp blood as a foreign a protein. So what you would say is that the serum contains the antibodies of the rabbit against the chimpanzee blood. So let's write that. Um, the serum um, made by the rabbit contains antibodies that are produced against. And that's what's important here. It's the against the chimpanzee protein. Chimpanzee protein. Okay, so the serum of the rabbit contains the antibodies that are produced against, and that's where your two marks are. Um, according to the above information, 
which animal is least closely related to the chimpanzee? Give a reason for your answer. Now, I remember that it was the pig. Okay, the pig was very low, low amount of per, uh, um, precipitate. The lower it is, the further away, the less related they are. So it's definitely the pig. So according to the above information, which animal is least closely related to the chimpanzee? It was the pig. Okay, now that would have given you one mark. Why the pig? It only forms... Um, a very low precipitate, a very low precipitate when blood, um, when you introduce the, uh, when blood is exposed to the serum. Okay, or you could say it forms a very low precipitate when the blood and the serum are mixed. But you have to say the word blood and the serum. Okay, so it's a low precipitate when the blood and the serum are mixed. There you go, that's your second mark there. Then question three, formulate a hypothesis for the investigation above. Now if we look at the investigation, okay, what are we investigating here? Okay. It's the percentage precipitate formed in the investigation. Now, what is that percentage precipitate formed? It's the percentage precipitate um, to show the relationship between chimpanzees. Now, remember, you can either say it shows a low, it shows a high. So you need to choose any of them. We're forming a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a statement. So we can say um, a high percentage of precipitate, man, precipitate formed indicates a close relationship with chimpanzees, okay, or you could have said a low percentage of precipitate indicates no relationship to chimpanzees, all right, or you see these are all the different hypotheses you could have done, or you could, said, could have said um, a high percentage of precipitate indicates um, a weak relationship to chimpanzees, all right? Or you could have said the same thing. A low percentage indicates a strong relationship. It, you're either proving or disproving. So for every single hypothesis that you come up with, you can either say, you can always divide it into four different hypotheses, depending on whether you want to prove something or whether you want to disprove it. You can either prove that a strong relation, a, 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 a strong precipitate, or lots of precipitate means a strong relationship, or little precipitate represents a weak relationship, or you can do the opposite of each of those. But either way, it gave you two marks. All right, but that's your hypothesis, and it's a statement. Now, name two variables. Now, when you get an exam paper and a question, which says name two, name three, name six, you underline two so that in your head you remember, I have to give two points to get those two marks. So name two variables that had, not, that had to be kept constant in this investigation. People, this question is always asked if they give you an, exam, uh, um, an experiment 
or a hypothesis or any kind of thing where you've got a scientist doing an experiment of sorts. You are going to always be asked this. Now, if we look at the two variables that must be kept constant, we would look at, for example, the temperature, because if the temperature changes, remember proteins are sensitive to temperature and pH. So we would keep the temperature constant. We could keep the pH constant without a doubt. We would keep the concentration of the serum constant. Um, or you could also say the amount of serum um, versus the blood the same. You would keep the concentration of the serum the same. You would use the same amount of blood for each sample. Because just think about this. If we go back and we say, well, the pig was the least closely related to the chimpanzee, but we only used a millimeter of pig's blood, whereas for the gorilla we used 20 mils, then sure, it's going to make more precipitate. You follow? So you've got to keep the amount of blood, the, the sample of blood the same. You've got to keep the concentration of serum the same. You've got to make sure that the pH and the temperature is the same for everything because then you're taking away any possible variable that can affect the results. Um, another variable would be, um, okay, you've got the serum would be taken from the same rabbit. But I mean, I'm thinking of various different uh, examples. Uh, if they look at, for example, pollination and how pollination affected a specific plant, then only work on a specific plant and the flowers on one specific branch. Or if you're working with seeds, take seeds from one plant, not seeds from various plants. Always make sure that you're taking away anything possible that can affect your results so that your results are pure. All right. And this, this question was taken from the DOE preparatory exam paper from 2008. And it's actually a very nice question. A lot of people, a lot of teachers complained about that question because they said, we've never taught this to our learners. We've never done blood tests and serums and antibodies and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's your knowledge of what a hypothesis is. And if they come up with something like that, what are they trying to prove? They're trying to prove that these animals are closely related to a chimp or they aren't. And if they aren't, why aren't they? How do you see that from the test results? So people remember, life sciences is a science. And within science, any science, you are going to have experiments. And you're going to have theories and hypotheses that have to either be proved or disproved. All right. If we look at human evolution, and this, is, this always brings a lot of argument to bear, uh, scientists estimate that the Earth is more than 5 billion years old. Remember, it's 5,000 million years old. So it's more than 5 billion years old. The geological evidence, that's what we can see in, in, in geology, in, in the whole geographical process of the Earth, indicates that simple life forms on Earth appeared 3.5 billion years years ago. That is a long time, people. Three and a half billion years. Now remember, there was nobody there with, with fancy computers and x-ray equipment and all that stuff. People didn't exist and no one had any means to write or, or take photos or anything like that. So this is all based on what they have found and carbon dating and um, having a look at absolute age, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so 3.5 billion years ago. There are many hypotheses, lots and lots. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry's got a hypothesis about where we came from. But none have, irre have been irrefutably proven. And that's why when we started this section of work, I said to you, you must learn this as a theory. Don't let it start worrying you about religion and genesis and what, what, what. Leave it. This is a theory. Work on this diversity section as theories that could or could not be true. If you believe they're not true, cool. If you believe they are true, cool. If you believe that it's all a load of nonsense, cool as well. But you must know this in order to answer your exams 
and do well in those exams. So, there are many hypotheses, but none have been irrefutably proven. Okay? Your archaeologists have provided fossil evidence. So, the archaeologists, those are the guys that dig things up, they've come up with fossil evidence. And they've said, okay, guys, to prove that relationships existed between the early Stone Age and the cultures in Europe and Northern Africa. So they've come up with their fossil evidence. Then we've got discoveries in South Africa, Kenya, Zimbabwe um, have been used to prove and validate that Africa was the home of early man. Now, I mean, we all know Africa is the best continent in the world, okay? Um, so this is nice, it's good for us, it's something to be proud of, it's a heritage. So they can prove that at the end of the day, what they found in South Africa and Kenya and Zimbabwe, that yeah, this was the hub where everything started as humans. Remember, we're looking at human evolution. So the anthro anthropogenesis, okay? Well, now you, you may not know what this word means. So your anthropologists check out people and, and, and where they come from and where they originate from based on their beliefs and what, what, what. And genesis means the beginning. It means in the beginning, the genesis. So we have oogenesis, the beginning of the egg cell. We have spermatogenesis, the making or the beginning of the sperm cell. Okay, so genesis means the beginning. So anthropogenesis is the study of human evolution and the development of homo sapiens, that's us, okay, as a distinct species from the ancestral superfamily. Now remember, it's a superfamily, hominidio. All right, so that's anthropogenesis. Where did we originate from? Well, we originated from here and there and everywhere, and, and we've got all the different theories and all the different versions, all right? Here, these guys say, based on fossils, this is what we can see. Okay, scientific disciplines like anthropology, primatology, which is your primate, so we know anthropology, primatology, looking at the structure of all your primates, so your baboons, your gorillas, your apes, your orangutans, etc., um, archaeology and genetics are used to map out the origins of humankind. So we are determined to find where on earth we came from. Evidence of common ancestors for living primates, including humans. So now we look here and we say, right, the term homo, and you'll see it's written in italics, refers to the genus and means to be human. Okay? Studies of human evolution must include hominids, such as, now these words are terrible to pronounce, so break it up. You have australopithecines, so australopithecines, as it is theorized that the Homo genus diverged, in other words, it split from them, about four million years ago in Africa. Okay, now remember we're going to do the out of Africa process or theory as well, hypothesis as well. So, we look at human evolution and we say it must contain the hominids. Why? Because it's theorized that the Homo genus split about four million years ago in Africa. Other species of Homo like Homo erectus, that was your first lot of guys that started walking upright, and your Homo neanderthalus, so those are your Neanderthal man, although some people still behave like Neanderthals nowadays, okay, have all become extinct. Now, I know that there's, there's a, a TV ad or an ad on TV where you've got these Neanderthals and they're pushing this big brown rock up a mountain and they both get up at the top of the mountain and the one bounces the other one's little ball off the end and they go, huh, huh. now that was Neanderthal. Those, those are Neanderthal men. And they're saying, well, become modern, what, 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 whatever the ad is about. But those are your Neanderthals. And they were, um, they had big foreheads and they looked very different, but they walked on two legs. 
And that's important. Your hominids all walked on two legs. Your Homo erectus walked on two legs. It was erect. It didn't walk on all fours. And people, there are scientists out there that say that that was the development of the humans. That's how we developed. We were on all fours and then we started walking more erect and spending more time erect and et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you look at a gorilla's behavior, when um, and a baboon and a orangutan, when they are threatened, they will stand up and make themselves bigger. So there are theories that say that maybe us as humans, because we wanted to dominate the animal world, we started standing up and becoming more erect. Who knows? Okay, none of us were there. So whether you believe it or not makes no difference. Learn it as a theory. So we're looking at our species of Homo, Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalus. They all became extinct. Why didn't we become extinct? And this is one of the questions. So substantial fossil proof exists to explain hominid evolution. Although, please people look at this, although it is not enough to make specific conclusions. So please, again, regard this as a theory. That's all it is. Now, what I've done here for you is I'm showing you a phylogenetic tree. In other words, the phylums and how genetically the splits apparently, according to theory, came about. So, I'm going to get this all onto here. Right, let's have a look. We started off with Hominidia as the main, you got kingdom as Animalia. You did this in grade 10, it's classification. So you have your kingdom Animalia, then you have your phylum as Chordata, you have the class as Mammalia. So Chordata, we have a spinal cord. Mammalia, because we give birth to babies, okay, live babies and we suckle our young until they're able to take care of themselves, there is parental care. So mammalia, the order is primates. So we start off with primates, there we have hominidia. From hominidia, we ended up with hylobatidae and the hominidia right here. Now the hominidae, so there's no O here, you see the O is gone, the hominidae, they split into the Pongiae and the Hominae. So there you've got your gibbons. That was about 18 Maya. One Maya is a million. So 18 million years ago. Then you've got the split between the, the Hilo uh, Bate and the Hominadia. All right, now they split. You've got your Pongiae and your Hominae. They split here at approximately, it's about 10. 12, no, it's about 10 million years ago. They split over here. That split results, now the Pongae end up becoming your orangutans. And then you have your Hominae, the Gorillini uh, and the Hominini, they split here at about 6 million years ago. So your Gorilla carry on there, and then your Hominy split again about... I'd say five and a half million years ago, they split into the pan and the homo. The homo ends up being us, and the pan end up being the chimpanzees. And this is how they say everything split up. So we all come from the same phylum, the same class, and the same order, and then the splits start. So scientists generally theorize that the homo pan split, so your homo pan split is here, all right? That homo pan split, that took place over four million years. It's about four and a half, five million years ago. Um, so there we go. Now, this is based on studies of the key gene sequences. Now people, that gene sequence is the way the genes are on the DNA. So if I've got the DNA strands, remember it's twirled, but I'm going to untwirl it. You've got your phosphate, your pentose sugar, and your nitrogenous base in the middle. Phosphate, pentose sugar, 
and your nitrogenous base. So your nitrogenous base is all along here, and you've got your phosphate and your pentose and a phosphate and a pentose. What makes a gene is a series of nitrogenous bases and the combination of your nitrogenous bases. And it's those combinations that give us our different characteristics. Okay, The fact that you may have very blue eyes and your brother or sister has blue eyes but they've got a slight green tinge to them. Um, you inherited that from your parents. Now remember, during meiosis one, we have crossing over during prophase one. Okay, We also have the random selection during metaphase one. All of that lends to variation and the different varieties that we have within one species. Okay, now, if we look at the gene sequences, and here we're looking at the key gene sequences of modern humans and of chimpanzees, and we say, right, that's when that split occurred. But please remember that a chimpanzee has 48 chromosomes. And that we as humans have 46 chromosomes. Now, if you look at a Down syndrome child, they have 47 chromosomes. And they are very different, and I use this term loosely, from a normal human person. Okay, they definitely are not chimpanzees. Okay, so you've got to be very careful here. We're looking at theories. They are theories. But when we look at the key gene sequences, this is when people start to make um, or start to surmise and make theories or come up with theories. Generally, species that belong to the same subfamily should share more than 97% of their DNA. The same subfamily, all right? The modern human genome, now remember the genome is all our chromosomes. All 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of chromosomes make up the human genome. It makes up your genome. And the chimpanzee genome is only about 70%, which says we cannot belong to the same subfamily because we're supposed to be 97% of our DNA is supposed to be shared, but we only share 70%. When DNA segments are analyzed and compared, the genetic sequence divergence varies significantly. In other words, these gene sequences here vary a lot, and they are very different. Now, if they are very different, it means that we are not closely related or as closely related as we seem to think. We are only 70% similar in DNA structure. Okay, but when we look at that specific genetic sequence, divergence, in other words, difference. To the learners that, that don't speak English as a first or a second language, divergence, diverge. Divergence means to be different. Okay, so the genetic sequence differences are, are just too different. They vary significantly. They vary a lot. Okay, between humans and chimps. Chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutan genomes have, a, have been sequenced and have 24 pairs of chromosomes, okay, in other words, 48, where humans have 23 pairs, which is the 46 I spoke about just now. So here, your chimpanzees, your gorillas, and your orangutans, they are closely related to each other, okay? But the humans, we only share 70%. But we also share about 65% with chickens. All right. So, I don't know. I can't think of, of saying that we are related to chickens. We aren't. It's too different. So, characteristics that humans share with other primates. People learn. Watch what I'm writing here. Learn well. They love to ask this in an exam. They'll give you a picture of a, 
uh, a diagram of an orangutan or a gorilla or a chimpanzee and a diagram of a human being and they're going to ask you to compare the two diagrams. You've got to know what we share and what we have in common with primates. Okay, number one, we have an opposable thumb. Okay, so what does that mean? We have the power to grip something, an opposable thumb. The thumb moves on its own. It's not part of the four fingers. Your four fingers work together, okay? They work in the same direction. Your thumb works on the other side, so my thumb can grip something, okay? We have opposable thumbs. We have bare fingertips. Now, if you look at chimpanzees and baboons and gorillas and monkeys, they have bare fingertips. So, it's your sense of touch. We have long arms. Now, relative to the rest of our body, uh, your arms means you can stretch, you can grab something, you can hold on to something. The same with chimpanzees and monkeys, etc. They've got long arms. All right? Freely rotating arms and hands. Your arm can rotate. All right? So you can swing nicely. All right? Your hands can rotate. Remember, you've got your gliding joints. So your hand can rotate as well. And why? We've got the ball and socket joint over here. Okay, and the gliding joint in the wrist, and that means we can rotate through 180 degrees. If you've ever watched monkeys swinging from one branch to the next, and then watch people acting out in a circus, humans working in a circus, especially your trapeze artists, and what they can do with their arms. Um, and just doing this, I, I immediately thought of someone swimming butterfly, you know, and, and when they swim butterfly, they're bringing their arms out of the water. This is a wonderful rotation movement. All right, and then the gliding joint of the wrist. Okay, we also have, look at this, stereoscopic vision. We have two eyes, and the two eyes face in the same direction. They're not on the sides of our head here. They're in front, and they face in the same direction. And if you close your left eye and you close your right eye, but put your finger here, and you look at your left and you look through your right, your finger moves. Why? We're seeing things for with two eyes, we have binocular vision. So with bi, and you've studied this, so with binocular vision, we take the image from the left, the, the right eye, we take the image from the left eye, and they are put together in the back of our brain so we can judge distance. We can say, this thing is one meter away from me and that one is two meters away from me. We are able to judge distance. So we have stereoscopic vision or binocular vision. Stereo, you know, means two speakers, so it's an easy way to remember it. And then visual acuity. Our eyes have an increased number of rod and cone cells and their own nerve cells where cone cells are able to see color. So your primates can see color as well and we can see color, and our rod and cone cells work perfectly well. They've got their own nerve cells. Okay, so if we just go back through this again, I'm going to do it over with you again. You've got to know this. They are going to ask it. All right, or well, the chances, I don't know, I don't set the paper, but the chances are they will ask this. So, opposable thumbs, bare fingertips. We have gliding wrist, okay, which can rotate, and ball and socket in the arms that are able to rotate. The arms are nice and long. You have stereoscopic vision, so we can judge depth. We have visual acuity. We have rod and cone cells with their own uh, uh, nerve cells, and we are therefore able to see color. All right, so those are the things we have in common. We also have skull around the face, so the eyes. We have a large brain. And if you look at your primates, they have large brains. Okay, not as big as ours, but they do have large brains as well. So these are all the things we have in common compared to body mass. Okay, which means that there is intelligence and thinking patterns. I mean, they've sent a chimp to the space, into space already. Um, there is intelligence. There are people that try to teach chimpanzees how to talk. And they are able to communicate. If you watch gorillas and chimpanzees and orangutans and monkeys, they communicate with each other all the time. Um, now it's just to get them to communicate in our terms, which is what people do try with, with your monkeys and your chimpanzees. So we have a large brain compared to body mass. We also have 
a brain center, which is able to process what we pick up with our senses. All right? Sense of touch, sense of touch, a, a, a sight especially. And if you look at your monkeys, the sense of smell is also very good. Olfactory center, which is what we're looking at here, is reduced. It's not as um, uh, well orientated as, for example, in the dog families. For example, your cat families and your dog families. They smell very well. Okay, we have few offspring. The same with, with the ape family, the primates. We have an upright posture and bipedalism. Now, we do have an upright posture. So do your gorillas and your baboons and your monkeys. When they sit, they sit upright and they check things out. All right? So it is the same. And they are able to walk on two legs, but they drop down onto all fours when they need to move very fast. But when they're going to attack something, they will stand up on both legs. So there is some bipedalism with them. Bipedalism, bi means two. Pedalism means feet or legs. Limbs. All right. So bipedalism, two legs. Upright posture and then the social dependency. They need their group. They, there is group cohesion. They live together. They live in families. And if you, if you look at gorillas in the mist and movies like that, where those gorillas are almost human-like. They are not human, though. They are human-like. They have a lot of traits that, with us that we have in common. Um, pr the mothers protecting their young. Um, the mothers loving having the young around them and how they are actually much more patient than we are with their young. And they teach their young by mimicking and imitation. All those things are similar. But these are, again, that what you can remember. So let's look at these. Large brain. We have a center in the brain for senses, especially seeing and the sense of taste and touch. All right. Olfactory is, a, is reduced from the other animals. Few offspring. Upright posture. With, and we, they can walk on two legs. We walk on two legs all the time. And then social dependencies. They live in their social group, their family. Okay, characteristics that make humans different from primates. Learn. Okay, humans are bipedal. We only walk on two legs, people. You never see anybody going down and running on all fours. All right, we only walk on two legs. Whereas baboons, monkeys, all your primates will, can stand up, but they don't like to walk around all the time on two legs. They still drop down on all, four, on all fours. We walk on two legs, uh, walking on two legs has implications beyond those affecting the skeleton and muscles of the scientists theorize that the upright position and the changes in the nervous system resulted in the enlargement of the brain. So we have a larger brain than these animals do. We also, if you look at the, the human face and skull is flat. It has no prognathus, which is a protruding jaw. If you look at a baboon's forehead the forehead does this then you've got the eyes then you've got the nose and then the top jaw and then the bottom jaw juts out okay look i'm not an artist but i'm sure you get the idea here so this would be a baboon's shape it sort of no it will do that that would be the shape it's got this here our foreheads go up so we have all of this brain space that a baboon or a chimpanzee does not, okay? And our jawline does this. So we, we don't have this protruding jaw there, okay? This is from Viblia et al. It's, it's biology second edition. This is an awesome book to have. And what it does here is it compares the gorilla and the human skeleton and the different adaptations that we have for being bipedal. Remember our hips, the hip structure, the pelvis is going to be different, all right, because we're supporting our entire upper body on our pelvis, whereas they aren't. They're supporting it on their hands, okay? Our big toes move in line with the other toes, whereas theirs don't. They spread out. You've got the greater curvature of the spine, our spine curves like that. Their spine is relatively straight. It curves over the top like that. 
um, the foramen magnon is at the center of the skull, and that is where the spinal cord goes into the brain. Now, for us, it goes into the center, and for them, it goes into the back here. So all of that is the adjustments that have had to be made to the actual skeleton so that we can walk straight up where they walk over the front. All right, now still the differences, dentation. We have similar to that of monkeys and apes, but different from the older primates like the gorilla. Okay, first of all, we have smaller canines. Why? Canines are there to rip flesh. Now, the only thing we rip is if we're eating biltong as South Africans. I don't even think the rest of the world does it. But if you're eating biltong, you're going to rip with your, with your canines. Okay, whereas they use canines to prote for protection and to eat. So, I mean, what is the first thing a gorilla that's angry is going to do? They're going to pull their lips up and they're going to show you those big teeth. And those teeth, if they dig into you, you're a dead person. All right, so we, they've got large canines. We have small little canines, okay? Our teeth are in a gentle curve. We have a wonderful little U-shape, whereas they have a very square shape with their canines jutting out over there. So we have this gentle U-shape or curvature. We have a large brain, all right? And we have learned to communicate through language. We talk. Animals will make funny sounds like, uh, 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 or kick, kick, kick. They make noises because they haven't learned the art of being able to speak yet. And even people that have taken hours and hours and hours trying to teach, um, uh, especially chimpanzees, and orangutans to speak. They end up making noises and they understand what you want, but they can't speak. Um, and really, they aren't that more advanced than a dog is because you can teach a dog hand signals and you can teach them um, words with the way you say them. And they learn as well, but they still bark. They can't make the noise. All right, what we've got here is a diagram to show you the differences uh, that would be Neanderthal man, okay? This would be um, a, a gorilla. You can see the huge eye sockets here, the lack of brain capacity over here, and the jutting jaw, and that would be a human. So if I was you, if this was given in an exam, for example, which it was, you would write, this is human, this is a gorilla, and this would be one of the Neanderthal men. So this would be a Neanderthal. Okay. Um, look at the lovely gentle U-shape here. And the same there. Whereas with the gorilla, it's got a, a far more squarer type mouth structure. Um, and then you have the upper jaw and the lower jaw. Again, we have this lovely U, whereas here the jaw sticks out, and here the jaw was a bit messed up as well. Okay, the process of gradual transition to becoming human is called hominization. Because remember, we're talking about the hominids. Now, hominization refers not only to the physical changes, but also diet, the movement, skeletal structure, and then the development of the social behavior, because that's what makes us human and not animals. Harmonization is believed to have been influenced by the development of speech, we can communicate, um, changes in sexual behavior with a pair of, uh, um, with pair bonding, favoring and protection of the mate, increased parental supervision of the offspring, etc. Now, you find this with gorillas and chimpanzees and orangutans as well. They, they tend to pair up or mate for life. So they have a partner, and if the partner gets killed, well, then that's it. So you have pair bonding. They also protect their mate and increase parental supervision from, for example, um, other animals, a whole lot of other animals. But there are some animals that also protect their babies fervently, like, for example, dogs and lions and um, all your cat family. They'll give their lives for their babies. So you have your parental supervision. 
it makes us special. Also, the development of the communal and social structure is very important. Um, we have our individuals in the groups, and some of them do one function and others do another function. Now, this is when we were hunting and sharing food and splitting the work in order to survive. Okay, so that should be Neanderthal man mainly. All right, let's look at this question. The diagram below shows a phylogenetic tree based on DNA similarities. The percentage to, next to each branch shows the amount of differences in the genome. So it's the differences that you are seeing. So there it would be a 1,4% difference. So all of these are differences. Make sure that you write it somewhere on this graph so that you remember the DNA nucleotide sequence of the two relevant groups. So let's have a look at our groups. Here we've got, it tells you phylogenetic tree based on DNA uh, um, similarities. And we've got, there's the millions of years. So this is at zero, this was at five, 10, 15, 20, and this is at 40 million years. So whatever this species was, this was the ancestral spe species. Um, so this is the ancestral species. And from here, we have the split, the old word monkey, and that splits into the gibbon and the family that originates the orangutan and the gorilla. And the gorilla splits from this one here and forms the hominids and the hominidia, humans, and then your common, your pygmy chimpanzee and your common chimpanzee. So they reckon that between the pygmy chimpanzee and the, and the common chimpanzee and humans, we have about a 1,4% difference. So again, this is a question, and they want to see how you respond. So from the diagram, determine how long ago the chimpanzee split from the line of the humans. That's easy. You use a ruler. You take your ruler. You have a look here and you take your ruler and you draw a line that goes all the way down. So it's approximately five Maya or five million years ago. Okay, so five Maya. All right, and that's easy. That's a lovely one mark for five and one mark for Maya. Then, which organism is most closely related to humans? Well, we saw it was the chimpanzee. We don't even have to go back and look at it. And it was the common chimpanzee and the other chimpanzee. So just chimpanzee is fine. There's your one mark. All right, three, calculate the DNA similarity between the genome of the chimpanzee and the human. Now, 100% would be identical. Minus, and if we look here, it was 1.4%. So 1,4% is equal to... 98,6%. So there's a 98,6% similarity. 98,6% is your two marks. Okay, the cradle of humankind. The cradle of humankind is a world heritage site, and it was first named by UNESCO. You need to know this, and it's located in the northwest province. It's just, it's very close to Joburg. It's only 50 k's outside Joburg. Now, many anthropologists believe that the hominids all over Africa, uh, lived all over Africa, but their remains are only found at sites where their bones were preserved into fossils. People remember, in order for a fossil to be preserved, okay, what you have to have is first dust or silt over the bones. You can't have water washing it away because you'll have one leg there and an arm there and a head over there. To keep it all together, they must have died in a cave or in some place. And a little bit of dust and um, silt going over the body parts and then compressing them into place. Otherwise, you end up with bits and pieces all over the show. So there are certain conditions in order for a fossilization to take place. It doesn't just happen every time an organism dies. Um, also, if they just fell down dead, you had all your scavengers and your animals that would c uh, come and eat in them. And then you would have sort of like a little piece of bone left, maybe, if the animal didn't eat at all. Okay. Um, the archaeological caves in Magapan Valley show traces of human occupation and evolution dating back to 3.3 million years. Now, that is a very, very, very long time ago. There's evidence that defines the origin and evolution of humankind with fossils in several species of early hominids 
dating back to between 4.5 million and 2.5 million years ago. Remember, we're working backwards. So if it's 1.5 million, it's closer to where we are, whereas if they say dating back to 4.5 million years, it's further away from where we are now. Okay, here are just pictures of the different types of um, skeletons that have been dug up in archaeological findings. First one you need to know is the Tung child. Now, the Tung child was found by Raymond Dart in the northwest province, and that's why it's called the Tung child, because it was found near a little town called Tung, Taung, actually. Um, this was in 1924. You don't have to worry so much about the dates, but you must know the, what the um, fossil is and who found it. Okay, And what it was was a juvenile Anthropithecus africanus skull. So there are quite a lot of different anthropithecus, but this one was specifically africanus. And the relevance is that the Tung child, look at this, the skull was positioned above the spine. That means that it was starting to work upright. And that is a human trait. All right, so that's why we like the Tung child. Now there's a picture of the Tung child skull and if you look here the foramen mag magnum moves more or less towards the middle which means that it had an upright position. Okay then we have Mrs. Pless and Mrs. Pless is probably the most popular fossil known to man. Okay she was found by Dr. Robert Bloom and John Robinson and at the Starkfontein Caves in 1947 and it was a 2.3 million year old part of a skeleton fossil, also Anthropithecus africanus. Okay, now if we look at the Tung child, the Tung child um, was found in 1924, and they reckon that this was about 2 million years old, whereas if we look at Mrs. Pless, she's 2.3 million years old. So, and Afri uh, also africanus, and why? Further evidence and proof that, by, supported by the findings of the Tung child, that the skull, the foramen magnum, is in the middle of the skull, so the spine comes down, which means it was upright. That's what the Mrs. Pless's skull looks like. She wasn't really a very pretty girl, if you look at her skull shape. But anyway, she was still an, um, an anthropithecus. Now, then we have little Lucy. And Lucy, is, it sounds like such a gentle, sweet name. Wait till you see the skull. She was found by Maurice Taib and his team. And this was in the Awash Valley in Ethiopia. All right, also 1974. So this was later. And there's 40% of a 3.2 million year old Anthropithecus, but not Africanus. This is Afarensis skeleton. Okay, they've given them different names. So this was 2.2 million years ago, and the relevance was that Lucy's skull capacity was small like an ape. So the, the skull was still tiny, but it showed bipedalism. In other words, where the foramen magnum was, at the base of the skull. So it showed that she was walking up upright, but the skull was still very small, showing a little brain. Okay, which proves, or the scientists assume, that that information tells them that to walk upright, bipedalism, came before the brain increase in the brain size because she had a little head, but she was walking upright. Okay. Then, little foot. Okay, this was Dr. Clark and Professor Philip Tobias and at the Swartkrans, which is right in the cradle of humankind. People make, a, make an attempt to actually go there and have a look at what's there. It's, it's awesome to go, go and look at the cradle of humankind and, and just look at what is there. They used to call it mankind for a long time, by the way. They now, in respect for women, call it humankind. I think the women's livers actually did something for us. Okay, when was it found? In 1997, so it was, it was quite soon, uh, probably when most of you were born. Then it's near 3.3 million year old Anthropithecus skeleton, and it, they haven't classified it as Africanus or Afarensis. Um, the relevance? Well, Littlefoot's skull capacity was large, so he had a good brain, okay? And 
shorter, broader pelvis, elongated legs with flat ankles, which showed the ability to support his weight for bipedalism. In other words, by now, he was walking erect. Okay, so again, we need to look at the development, not when they were found. They were there anyway. They're three or four million or 3.23, uh, 3.3 million years every time. So make a little table and learn them like that. Okay, here's little foot and pretty much the whole skeleton. And then also these are just different points that you need to know. They may give it to you in a comprehension type question. At least then you've seen it. We have the first family, which was at site 333 in the Rift Valley. Um, and there were 13 individuals that were thought to have died in a flash flood. So they uncovered this little family there. And you'll see they call it site 333 because that was where they started digging. And they had 3,300 or 400 different places where each of the groups did their digs. Then in 2001, now look at this. There was the seven million year old fossil skull called Tamai. And this was discovered near Chad. And they reckon that this is possibly, possibly the earliest hominid fossil found seven million years ago. And then in 2006, in a dig in Ethiopia, they found a three year old, year old um, anthropolipithecine. And they called this little one Salam. Okay, so it was a little baby, just two years old. Okay, there's Tumai, was discovered near Chad. You see all the pieces, clearly the skull was broken up with pressure or whatever, and they take all these little pieces and they piece them together. Now, out of Africa hypothesis, and this is something to be proud of, make sure you know it, and if I was an examiner, I would ask this to you. All right, the evidence of African origins of modern humans, they say, most scientists agree that Homo sapiens evolved in Africa and then they spread outwards. So they started in Africa and then they went up to Europe and Asia, etc. So you got Europe over here and Asia. Some scientists support an alternative theory that humans evolved as a single species of Homo erectus in Asia. And as Africans, we're going to say that's nonsense. We like the idea that everything started here. Okay, we special. Fossil evidence supports the African origin and the Y chromosomal DNA and the mitochondrial DNA. Now, people, when you did DNA, okay, you learned about the mitochondrial DNA and you learned about the chromosome DNA. Now, the mitochondrial DNA is very important as well, and they use that in the research. Now, the Out of Africa hypothesis was developed by Chris Stringer, and Peter Andrews. That's an easy one to remember because it's two first names. So Chris Stringer, Stringer and Peter Andrews, and they said that the modern Homo sapiens evolved in Africa about 200,000 years ago, and they migrated outwards to Europe and Asia. And that's what we call the Southern Dispersal Theory. So what is the Southern Dispersal Theory? It's that everything started, Homo sapiens started here in Africa, and we dispersed outwards. Okay? This theory is based on genetic, okay, genes, linguistic, which is language, and archaeological evidence, where the researchers have used the mitochondrial DNA, and they've said we all are descendants of mitochondrial Eve. So Adam and Eve, there's mitochondrial Eve, and she was a woman that was in Africa. And that, that's why we're all brothers and sisters, I suppose. Okay, out of Africa theory is also supported by the fact that we have genetic diversity is the highest in our African populations. And then your anthropologists and paleontologists have collected substantial evidence to show that humans started Af in Africa and they moved out into Europe and Asia. And they also reckon that the blue eyes on the blonde hair that you find in Britain and Scandinavia and the European countries is because we became bleached. So we left Africa, and because there's so little sun, we actually started bleaching, and that's where the blue eyes and the, and the blonde hair came from. So the oldest center of civilization, out of everything that they found archaeologically, is Egypt, Mesopotamia and the Indus Basin. All right, that's where they find all these things. 
So it can only stand to reason that that's where the people were. The question is, why did early humans immigrate from Africa to Europe and Asia? And they say that maybe it was the Ice Age, the glacial period, and it was hotter there and colder here, so we moved. There was no food. If it gets too cold, there's no food, so we moved. Food sources like plants and animals would have been severely impacted, so movement to a warmer place where there was an abundance of food took place. Now, this is our last question, and let's move through it quickly. A comparison of the an anatomical features of organisms has helped scientists to propose evolutionary relationships. Now, remember I said to you, they can give you a skeleton of some sort and then ask you to compare them. Now, here they've given us Homo, which would be humans. Okay? You've got your Anthropithecus and you've got your chimpanzee. Now, if we look at the, that's the bottom view and that's the side view of the skull. So, if you look here, the forehead is quite high. Lots of brain capacity here. We've also, we've got less brain capacity. Okay, and here we've got very little brain capacity. So, there's less, let's make it like that. And this is very little. Here we have a very protruding jaw. Here it's less protruding, and here it doesn't protrude. All right? Foramen magnum is right in the center of the skull at the bottom. Here it's moving to the back, and there it is right at the back, which means this is still bipedal, and this is definitely bi uh, bipedal, and this is not. This is on all fours. All right. So, tabulate three observable differences between the side view of the skulls and the homo. And the, okay, we haven't got time to write this, so let's go through this. Okay, we want three observable differences, so let's go with our differences here. First of all, the foramen magnum between the homo and the chimps is in the center of the skull, whereas here the foramen magnum is at the back of the skull. This means that it's bipedal, that means it walks on all fours. All right? If we look here, we have a gentle curve of the upper jaw, and here it forms a square curve of the upper jaw. Very small canines, you can't see them. Here the canines are huge, all right, so large canines. Um, we have a protruding jaw line here, upper jaw. Here we have a slanting, very little protrusion. Um, and I think that's about it that we can see here. Large brain capacity because the forehead lifts gradually up, where here there is a sharp incline from the eyebrow all the way to the skull, very little brain capacity. So people, there you go. Lots and lots and lots of differences that you'd be able to see here. Also another one is the, um, the, the, the bone. The orbit of the eye is large and has a ridge. Here the orbit of the eye is in the front of the face. Okay, so those are the differences. Then if we look down, which one of the organisms, Anthropithecus or the chimpanzee, is, was quadruped? We've already said that the Anthropithecus, because of where the foramen magnum was, definitely was bipedal. Bipedal. Whereas the chimpanzee was on all fours, so the answer is chimpanzee. And that would have given you the mark there. And then the last question here, give one observable reason for your answer in question two. It was the location, location of the far, uh, foramen magnum. That's that hole for the spinal cord. Um, location of the foramen magnum in the chimpanzee is towards the back of the skull. Okay. And if it's towards the back of the skull, it means that it has to sit like that. And it only does that because it's down here on all fours. All right. 
people, when you get diagrams, first thing you do is you take your pen and you write things on that diagram. Because everything that you can see, everything that you can notice, I guarantee you now, is asked in a question. And your brain's already processed it. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, thank you very much for spending the last hour and 15 odd minutes with me here at Mindset. I hope you've learned plenty. Now go and print out the X sheets because everything you need to know is in those X sheets and especially the definitions. Make sure you know your definitions. Make sure you know your diagrams. People, good luck. Study hard. What you put in is what you'll get out at the end of the day. Have an awesome time. Be good. Bye-bye. <laughs>